winner is a dreamer who never gives up. It almost seems impossible until it's done. Amazing quotes, aren't they? Inspiring, motivating. Yes, they are. Written by our great Nelson Mandela. The person who is the icon of democracy and social justice. The person who is described as the father of the nation in South Africa. The person who has received the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, such a dynamic personality. Well, this chapter, chapter 2 in your first flight, Nelson Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. It's an autobiography, right? This chapter is a part of that autobiography. So yes, if we know his whole name, it's by Nelson Rolilala Mandela. So yeah, let's know a little more about him. Nelson Rolilala Mandela was a great hero who gave freedom to the blacks in South Africa. He was born in Viso in Yumtata, then a part of South Africa's Cape Province. He fought against the apartheid regime of South Africa, which believed in racialism. He spent more than 30 years in South Africa's prisons. Well, apartheid, if I talk about, uh, it is that, uh, you know, it's that grave issue that had occurred then. It was... Uh, it was discrimination uh, in caste, creed, gender. There was a lot of discrimination then. Yeah, color, all of it. So we shall know in detail ahead. He became the first black president of South Africa when his parts came to power in democratic elections in 1994. You have to know this. He was the first black president of South Africa. This passage forms a part of the autobiography of Nelson Mandela titled Long Walk to Freedom. Now, if I talk about the title by itself, what does it tell you? He had taken that long walk. He had gone through a lot of struggles to attain freedom. That's what your title is telling you, Long Walk to Freedom. Now, moving further, it is a saga of the glorious struggle that the blacks of South Africa waged against the apartheid regime to gain freedom. They wanted to get free of the discrimination. They wanted to get free of all the tortures. They wanted to behave and, you know, they wanted to be looked upon as humans and not animals. So let's see further, what does this thing tell us? First, as we move to the plot, Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa, fought for the freedom of his people. Now, he was the one who had selfless love. What do I mean by selfless love? Selfless love is first when you think about the other than yourself. You consider yourself last. If I talk the love of your parents, first and foremost, that's selfless love. See, generally what happens, all the other uh, relations, if we talk of, they have some selfish motive in that. Yes, they do. But if I talk of parents, it is totally selfless. They don't want anything out of you. They want you to progress. They want the best for you. They don't want anything in return. Whereas in any other relationship, if you will see, there are expectations. Of course, parents expect too. But what do they expect? Your benefit. Yes, they expect you to be good humans. That's all they expect. They don't have selfish motives. So coming back to this, Nelson Mandela was of the type. He was highly patriotic and he had selfless love for his people. He, did, he just wanted freedom for all of them. He wanted all of them to be really happy. Yeah, he did not want them to suffer. He did not want them to go through the tortures. So yes, he fought for the freedom of his people. He was discriminated by the whites along with other black people. He was an enthusiastic young boy who considered staying away from his home to be free. He wanted, he had to stay away from his home to be free. He wanted to marry the person of his choice. Come on, every human, it's a general human tendency. You want to get married. He wanted to marry the person of his choice. Gradually, he realized that freedom is more meaningful. He then got to know, in fact, freedom is way more meaningful. He decided to bring freedom for his own people. On 10th May 1994, 
he was able to materialize his dreams. You know, that's where they, his quote, I began your module with that. A winner is a dreamer who never gives up. He was one of them. He finally won and he materialized his dreams on 10th May 1994. In Nelson Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, he gives two contradictory pictures of his country. One in which the black people were tortured, right? There was discrimination and they had to suffer quietly. And the second that he gives is when the blacks will be free to live a life of their own. They will be totally free. They will not have any pressure. They will not have anybody ruling over them. This is what he's trying to show. Yes, the two pictures out here. So as we begin our chapter, as always, you have the difficult words highlighted. You have the meanings for the same. In your question bank, you will have your notes, your practice questions. You have MCQs for practice. You have all of them. So look, this is an entire platter. You don't need to refer to anything else. Once you are done with this video, please, you make sure that you watch the video till the end to understand, to get the concept clear of the entire chapter. Yes. After that, you can go on to your MCQs, your questions, your notes, and then even practice papers. So you see, it's right from A to Z. Right from the beginning till the end, you are totally insured. And I ensure you good results if you actually follow each and every module in the right manner. Yes? So please give it your 100% to get the 100%. So let's begin. 10th May dawned bright and clear. For the past few days, I had been pleasantly besieged by dignitaries and world leaders who were coming to pay their respects before the inauguration. Now, what inauguration are we talking about? Yeah, here when he was being signed by, I mean, signed as the president. So by then, 10th May dawned bright and clear. Why was it bright and clear? Every morning was a morning. The sun rose. But why specifically 10th May was bright and clear? Yes, because the black attained their freedom. He was being signed as the president. The, you know, the rule of the white was going and he was coming there as a president. So he was taking over. So it was nice and bright and clear. Yes, for the past few days, uh, obviously this doesn't happen overnight. So for the past few days, I had been pleasantly besieged as in, you know, surrounded closely by dignitaries, people considered to be important because of high rank or office. So yes, he was surrounded by such people since the past few days and world leaders who were coming to pay their respects before the inauguration. They were coming to pay their respects. Imagine it was a mark of respect. All the world leaders were coming there actually to pay their respects to him. Why? Because you know, everyone, because of the apartheid, because of the discrimination going on in South Africa, everyone stayed away from this country. Nobody wanted to be a part of it. Nobody wanted to do any kind of, you know, interactions with that country. But once that was dissolved with the help and because of Nelson Mandela, everyone came there to salute this man, to salute his you know, his conviction, his, uh, the way he actually did it, they all came to pay a good grand salute to him. So yes, the inauguration would be the largest gathering ever of international leaders on South African soil. It was the largest gathering ever. Never before all the world leaders, leaders from across the world had come to South Africa. It had never happened. The ceremonies took place in the lovely sandstone amphitheater formed by the Union buildings in Pretoria. Amphitheater, we all know it is a building without a roof with many rows and seats in steps. You know, you have that steppy thing, yeah, typical of ancient Greece and Rome. It was all open theaters, you know, they call amphitheaters. So yes, the ceremonies took place there in the lovely sandstone amphitheater formed by the Union buildings in Pretoria. For decades, this had been the seat of white supremacy. 
white supremacy, the white were ruling. The British was ruling over them. So they had a lot of issues. They had faced a lot of problems. The people were in, you know, they were in pain mentally, physically, emotionally. They were highly tortured. And now it was the site of a rainbow gathering of different colors and nations for the installation of South Africa's first democratic non-racial government. Now these two lines have a lot to speak. They have a lot to say. So it was the site of a rainbow gathering. What do you mean by a rainbow gathering? Why is the you know gathering described as a rainbow? Well generally it was black or white. Okay here we have the combination. It was first white now came in the black but there were world leaders there were people across the world so there were people of different skin of different color of different caste everybody was there irrespective so it was a rainbow it was you know a union of all the people of different castes and belonging to different countries with different skin I mean you know it is generally you have the white and the black but then here it was everyone so it is a rainbow gathering of different colors and nations for the installation of what South Africa's first democratic non-racial government non-racial there will be no discrimination people will not be tortured everyone will be treated equally unlike when there was white supremacy when the white were ruling it was different but now everyone will be on the same page this was Nelson Mandela's dream he did not want to he was even against the white but he wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page why was there you know you Ill, they being ill-treated for what he did not want that he wanted to give that you know equality amongst all On that lovely autumn day, I was accompanied by my daughter Zanani. Now on that autumn day, autumn day as in, uh, okay, so we know uh, South Africa is, you know, situated in the southern hemisphere, right? If we look at the globe, it is situated there. Now at that point of time, you know, it was autumn over there. Yeah. So he says, on that lovely autumn day, I was accompanied by my daughter Zanani. Now, if I look at autumn, autumn is what? Shedding of leaves, right? We can also take it like this. If, if you really want to go into the depth, uh, so autumn is all about shedding of leaves. Now, here it is what? Shedding all the inequality, removing that. And then it is spring where comes the fresh leaves. So right now, it was shedding away all the negativity, all the torture, all the pain. It was shedding of that. Yes, so I can still call it an autumn day. On the podium, Mr. D. Clerk was first sworn as second deputy president. Then Thabo Becky was sworn in as the first deputy president. Yes, so you see first they were sworn in and then it was his turn. When it was my turn, remember this is a part of an autobiography. I'm sure we all know what's an autobiography. When you yourself write about your life. Yes. Biography is when someone else does it for you. Yes. When you write on someone else's life. But autobiography is when you write about yourself. So he says when it was my turn. My turn as in Nelson Mandela. Because he has written it. I pledged. I promised to obey and uphold the constitution. And to devote myself to the well-being of the republic and its people. He wanted the well-being of each and every soul over there. To the assembled guests and watching world, I said, so beautifully said, to the assembled guests, to the guests who had gathered out there and the watching world, the world who was watching them, I said, today, all of us do by our presence here, Confer glory and hope to newborn liberty. Beautiful. All of us by our presence here today, with all our presence here, 
confer glory confer as in it's a formal word here give okay give glory and hope to the new born liberty 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 freedom it has been newly born today out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud he says so far it has been disastrous life has been a torture it has been you know a a, a journey full of pain full of agony full of grief for every black why because they were not you know treated equally they were tortured they were ill treated today let's you know it's that journey which is gone now the society which is born okay where all the humanity will be proud they will be proud to be a part of that country a citizen of that country humanity humans humanity will be proud we who were outlaws not so long ago who were outlaws as in because of its policy of apartheid many countries had been earlier broken off diplomatic relations with south africa they had earlier broken off diplomatic i told you nobody was ready to you know interact with this country so they had all broken off their relationships right so we who were outlaws we who had got disconnected from south africa not so long ago have today been given the rare privilege to be host to the nations of the world on our own soil today we are proud that the same people are here on our soil and we are hosting them they are our guests we are hosting we are playing the host we thank all of our distinguished international guests for having come to take possession with the people of our country of what is after all a common victory for justice for peace for human dignity he says today i thank each one of you all those who have traveled across all the international guests all the dignitaries who have come here for having come to take possession with the people for what of our country of what is after all it is a common victory it is a victory which is for everyone it is not just the black it is a victory for justice for peace and for human dignity please look upon the others as same don't look down upon them it's human dignity they also have their self respect so we need to you know i mean you know actually accept the differences we need to respect the differences we have at last achieved our political emancipation emancipation as in freedom from restriction there were a whole lot of restrictions don't do this don't do that don't go here n number of them n number so at last they have achieved our political emancipation as in freedom from restriction we pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from the continuing bondage of poverty deprivation suffering gender and other discrimination he says today we pledge ourselves we want to free everyone from poverty from deprivation deprivation as in the state of not having one's rightful benefits they did not have the right to vote they did not have so many rules so many powers they did not have they were totally powerless yes so they did not have their own rightful benefits then they had a lot of suffering they wanted to free him he wanted to free them from suffering from the gender discrimination and other discriminations as in being treated differently or unfavorably so he wanted to free them from all of them all the negativity never never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another he is so 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 confidently saying this that never not once but thrice 
never, never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will ever be ruled by someone else, that on this soil will one rule over the other, oppression of one by another. It will not happen. Everyone will be treated equally. Everybody will be on the same page. Everyone will have the equal rights. The sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. He says the sun shall never set on. It shall never set on so glorious. If this human achievement, this what we have achieved is the most beautiful moment of pride. It's glorious. It's a moment of pride for all of us. Let freedom reign. Let freedom rule. God bless Africa. A few moments later, that's how he ended his speech. A few moments later, we all lifted our eyes in awe as a spectacular array of South African jets, helicopters and troop carriers rode in perfect formation over the Union buildings. As soon as he, you know, spoke his last words, God bless Africa, immediately all of them were distracted. They started looking up. What was there? They lifted their eyes in awe. They were like, wow, as a spectacular array. Spectacular array as in an impressive display. There was something there in the sky. It was a colorful and attractive display of South African jets. You know, uh, you have these when we uh, watch on... Um, Republic Day, even on Independence Day, we come across those flights going up and, you know, with the uh, colorful smoke coming out from uh, there. So this is how it was. There were colorful jets, helicopters and troop carriers. They roared, they went through, but they had perfect formations. They were forming different formations over the Union buildings because that is where in the amphitheater this whole ceremony was taking place. So they all looked up immediately. It was not only a display of pinpoint precision and military force, but a demonstration of the military's loyalty to democracy. See, he says it was not only a display of pinpoint precision, it was accurate. It was, you know, it was absolutely, the formations was so amazing, you would be shocked. That's why they were in awe. They were like, wow. They were totally, you know, dazed by it. They were totally uh, shocked. They were taken for a big surprise. So it was not about the precision uh, of the military force, but it was a demonstration of the military's loyalty to democracy. This, de this freedom that they had got, they were loyal towards it. So military's loyalty to democracy, to a new government that had been freely and fairly elected. This government did not just force itself up. They had been fairly and freely elected. They were chosen. It is, they were chosen by the people. That's how it actually made Nelson Mandela really proud. That is the reason it was a glorious moment for them because they had been chosen upon, they had been elected. They had not forced their way. So they had been elected to form the new government, right? And only moments before, the highest generals of the South African Defense Force and police, their chests bedecked with ribbons and medals from days gone by, saluted me and pledged their loyalty. He says, only moments before, just a few moments before, the highest generals of the South African Defense Force and Police, all of them, their chests bedecked, bedecked as in uh, decorated. I mean, come on, they're all generals. So, you know, they have all those ribbons and medals. With ribbons and medals from days gone by, saluted me and pledged their loyalty. You can imagine where once you were being so looked down upon and today you have all of them saluting you and paying respect to you. Wow, it, it's the, you know, highest moment of pride. I was not unmindful of the fact, not unmindful as in 
conscious of or aware of. It's not that I was not aware of the fact that not so many years before, they would not have saluted but arrested me. He says the same thing, if I, w if I was not you know, a part of that government right now, these are the same people right now who are saluting me would have arrested me. I'm aware. Finally, a chevron of Impa Impala jets left a smoke trail of the black, red, green, blue and gold of the new South African flag. Finally, a chevron as in a pattern in the shape of a V. That's a chevron, you know, in the pattern, uh, in the shape of a V. All the Impala jets, they left a smoke trail. You know, it comes from the tail. There's a trail of smoke. And which colors? Black, red, green, blue and gold. These were the colors of the new South African flag. The day was symbolized for me by the playing of our two national anthems. Generally, every country has one national anthem. Why were two played? And the vision of the whites singing Nikosi Sikelil e Africa. Okay, let's learn a little of the African language. Nikosi is Lord. Sikelel is bless and e Africa is Africa. So Lord bless Africa. That was the anthem. So the whites were singing that and the blacks singing die stem, the old anthem of the Republic. So there was one uh, anthem for the whites and one for the blacks. Although that day, neither group knew the lyrics of the anthem they once despised. They once had a very low opinion of. Now, you know, obviously the whites did not know the lyrics of the black and the black did not know the lyrics of the white. They used to, you know, look, up, uh, look down upon the other. They had a very low opinion of the other anthems. They would soon know the words by heart. He says, right now, we didn't know each other's anthems. But I'm sure very soon we will know the words by heart. On the day of the inauguration, I was overwhelmed with a sense of history. That I was literally overwhelmed because he could see so many great things happening out there. In the first decade of the 20th century, a few years after the bitter Anglo-Boer War and before my own birth, the white-skinned peoples of South Africa patched up their differences and erected a system of racial domination against the dark-skinned peoples of their own land. It was before he was born that this discrimination, this racial discrimination, the discrimination with the black, you know, the, those people not getting their rights, not getting their powers, it had started then. It was that time. When a few years after the bitter Anglo-Boer war and before he was born, that was the time this whole thing started. The white-skinned peoples of South Africa patched up their differences amongst themselves and they erected, they came up with a system of racial uh, domination against the dark skin. The dark skin are the black, right? People of their own land. The structure they created formed the basis of one of the harshest, terrible, most inhumane societies the world has ever known. People did not have any humanity against the dark-skinned. They were totally inhumane. They were very, very, very harsh with them. Terrible. And those people had to suffer. The dark-skinned people had to suffer it quietly. Now, in the last decade, now this was where it was in the first decade of the 20th century. Now, if you talk about the last decade of the 20th century and my own eighth decade as a man, that system had been overturned forever and replaced by one that recognized the rights and freedoms of all peoples, regardless of the color of their skin. Today, they all stand equal regardless of the color of their skin today they have their rights and they have the freedom the same people on the same land they have it all that day had come about through the unimaginable sacrifices you cannot even imagine the sacrifices that they must have done of thousands of my people 
people whose suffering and courage can never ever be counted or repaid. The sacrifices that they had made, nothing on earth can ever repay that. The way they had sacrificed, impossible. They can never be repaid for the same. You cannot even count the sacrifices. Innumerable and they were terrible. There were so many, right? I felt that day as I have on so many other days that I was simply the sum of all those African patriots who had gone before me. He says, I was just feeling it like any other day. I was feeling the same that I was simply the sum. I was a part. I was, you know, a part of that group of all those African patriots of all those before him who had gone before me. That long and noble line ended and now began again with me. Then the, that whole line was over. Now it starts again with me. I was pained that I was not able to thank them and that they were not able to see what their sacrifices had wrought. He says, I feel bad that today I today they are not there that I can thank them or they are not there to see that what all they sacrificed today what you know what it has brought what are the benefits what is the actual output the outcome of all their sacrifices I'm sorry I feel pain that I cannot even thank them and they cannot even see what is the result of their sacrifices. The policy of apartheid created a deep and lasting wound in my country and my people. That policy of apartheid, like I already told you, it is a policy or a system in South Africa of segregation. You're separating or discrimination on the grounds of race. Which race do you belong to? So this had created this policy, it had actually created a deep and a lasting wound, a wound which never got healed. You know, you get a wound, it heals up in some days, anything, even, uh, I mean, you know, even the smallest thing you lose for a few days, you have the pain, you, you just feel bad and, and gradually, you know, with time, it heals up. But this policy, it created a lasting wound. People were not able to forget all what they had gone through. All of us will spend many years, if not generations, recovering from that profound hurt. Profound as in very deep and strong. That hurt, that pain was so deep and strong that I don't know how many, after how many years, maybe we might tend to forget. Of course, generations will be difficult. I mean, if you're living that long. But yes, maybe in the uh, next few, uh, you know, upcoming years, maybe you tend to forget. But the decades of oppression and brutality had another unintended effect. Now this oppression and brutality that they had, you know, what injustice they faced. Now this also had another effect. It was another unintended effect. And that was that it produced the Oliver Tambus, the Walter Sicilis, the Chief Luthulis, the Yusuf Dadus, the Bram Fishers, and the Robert Sobequis of our time. Men of such extraordinary courage, wisdom, and generosity that their like may never be known again. Now, who were these people? They were all the South African politicians. They were the leaders. They were the teachers. They were the lawyers. So this is what this effect, the other effect was that it produced all these people. And these people had extraordinary courage, wisdom, and generosity. And he says, even today, we cannot have people like them, that their like may never be known again. Perhaps it requires such depths of oppression to create such heights of character. Wow, very beautiful. If you really understand this line, it requires such depths of oppression. That means when people actually go through this torture, you know, too much of oppression, that is the time such wonderful, you know, characters are born. It creates such heights of character. 
when you go through all this that is where people actually burn out and they shine like gold you know how the diamonds they sparkle this is how after you go through all the tortures in the end you sparkle my country is rich in the minerals and gems that lie beneath its soil but i have always known that its great wealth is its people finer and truer than the purest diamonds he says my country is very rich south africa is rich for minerals and gems we are all aware of it aren't we but what nelson mandela believes it because the people out there are finer and truer then they are better than the purest diamonds it is the people that actually makes the country rich not these materialistic gems and minerals it is from these comrades in the struggle that i learned the meaning of courage i got the meaning of courage right with these friends of mine time and again i have seen men and women risk and give their lives for an idea I have seen men stand up to attacks and torture without breaking showing a strength and resilience that defies the imagination he says i have seen people do it i have actually seen men stand up to attacks and torture without breaking they have faced it with so much of courage and strength all the torture and the attacks they have literally faced them showing a strength and resilience as in the ability to deal with any kind of hardship and recover from its effects they faced it and still they started they did not give up they did not break down the number of times they fell they stood up they stood up with all their strength and enthusiasm and they fought back showing a strength and resilience that defies the imagination openly resists or refuses to obey appears to be challenging someone it defies your you cannot even imagine that strong they were i learned that courage was not the absence of fear if you are not afraid does not does it doesn't mean that you are courageous but the triumph over it when you win over your fear then you are courageous the brave man is not he who does not feel afraid but he who conquers the fear you win over it you conquer the fear and yes then you call yourself courageous otherwise it's not the right definition of courage no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion he says you are not born with it you are not born with that mindset that you're supposed to hate this dark skin people or you're supposed to love the white skin people it's not the case you are not because of the color of the skin or his background or religion it's not the case people must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate they can be taught to love for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite he says if people can be taught to hate you know you are taught do this and do that that's how your mindset becomes but if you are taught to hate if if that hate can be taught love can come more naturally you'd rather teach your people to love you need to you know teach them they need to learn to love and that comes more naturally to the human heart than hate than its opposite even in the grimmest times in prison where they, when there was the most you know the painful times when my comrades and i were pushed to our limits we were pushed to our limits we were pushed to the last point in our ability to bear the pain the prison you have no idea they had to literally walk on fire probably they had to walk on you know those stony or those pokey uh, you know the pokey things over there it was terrible they were made to carry lots and lots of heavy things they would fall they were hurt they were not given food there were n number of tortures they went through n number of them they were pushed to their limits to the last line to the most saturated point where anyone can break down he and his friends went to that limit they suffered they took all those tortures they took all the pains i would see a glimmer of humanity in one of the guards 
perhaps just for a second, but it was just enough to reassure me and keep me going. He says at that point of time, I would see a glimmer of humanity in one of the guards. I would just see them. I would just feel that thought over there. I would look at the guard and, you know, have that humanity in that. And even just for a second, if that would happen, that one second would give me that, you know, that booster. It was like a booster for me that it kept me going. You know, it reassures me that don't worry, everything will be fine. And that kept me going. Man's goodness is a flame that can be hidden but never extinguished. Your goodness gets coated, you know. A, a good person be, uh, gets, you know, affected. You know, you get affected by something wrong, but the goodness remains. It disappears. It gets, you know, covered with other layers. But eventually when all those layers, you know, they open back again or they dissolve, you are back to a good person. That flame is not extinguished. It is always there. It is just hidden. The dark clouds actually hide them, but it remains. In life, every man has twin obligations, twin duties. Obligations as in course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound, basically your duties. Which are the two duties that every man has to do? He has those twin obligations to his family, to his parents, to his wife and children. So basically the entire family. And he has an obligation to his people, his community, his country. So every person has these twin obligations, twin as in two duties to perform. One duty you perform towards your family, maybe as a husband, maybe as a son, maybe as a father, maybe as a brother. You have to perform all your duties, right? The second is towards the community, towards the country. Yes, you have to make sure that you perform both the duties. In a civil and humane society, each man is able to fulfill those obligations according to his own inclinations and abilities. In a well-civilized society where humanity exists, yes, each man is able to fulfill those obligations according to his own inclinations. That's the natural tendencies of behavior. According to their, the way they have their own tendency, you know, their own behavior. According to that and according to his ability. What are his potentials? What he can do? But in a country like South Africa, it was almost impossible for a man of my birth and color to fulfill both of those obligations. He says, but unfortunately, in South Africa, in a country like South Africa, it was totally, nearly impossible to actually, you know, take care and fulfill both of those obligations, being a man of my birth, a Negro, a dark-skinned, and color. In South Africa, a man of color who attempted to live as a human being was punished and isolated. Do you even understand what this line is telling you? It is telling you a man of color, dark skin, who attempted to live as a human being. He's a man, he's a human being, he will live like a human being. But he, even if he tried to live as a human being, he would be punished and isolated. Just imagine that means being a human, you are not living as a human being. You are being treated as an animal. You are not being actually treated like a human being. In South Africa, a man who tried to fulfill his duty to his people was inevitably ripped from his family and his home and was forced to live a life apart. A twilight existence of secrecy and rebellion. Now just imagine. Just see what tortures they went through. So he says, a man who tried to fulfill his duty to his people, to his own people, what would happen to him? Inevitably, unavoidably, that means definitely, he would be ripped from his family. He would be taken from his family, his home, and he was forced to live a life apart. He would stay away from his family. He would be taken away far from his family, 
a twilight existence of secrecy. He would be taken into such a place where nobody would know and rebellion, action or process of resisting authority, control or convention. This is what he would face if he would perform his duty towards his people. Now just imagine, can you even while reading, it's literally giving me goosebumps. You can imagine the people who actually must have gone through it. They went through hell, literally alive. You know, people die and go to heaven or hell. That's what it said, according to your karmas, according to your deeds. But here, alive, very much breathing, they faced hell on earth. I did not in the beginning choose to place my people above my family. Initially, that was not the way. I did not in the beginning choose to place my people above my family. But in attempting to serve my people, I found that I was prevented from fulfilling my obligations as a son, a brother, a father and a husband. He says, first I did not keep them on top. The people, I did not keep them over my family. My family was my priority. But in, the, in attempting to serve my people, while I was serving my people, I found that I was prevented. I somehow, they became my second, on, they became second on the list. Me, you know, performing my duty as a family person, as playing my roles as a son, father, brother or husband, it automatically went on the second place. People became my priority. I was not born with a hunger to be free. He says, I was not born with that hunger. When I started living, when I started facing, when I started observing, that hunger within me came, that I wanted to be free. I was born free, free in every way that I could know. When you're born, you're born free of everything. Free to run in the fields near my mother's hut, free to swim in the clear stream that ran through my village, free to roast mealies under the stars and ride the broad backs of slow moving bulls. What is he talking? He's talking about his childhood where he was absolutely free. That time there is no pressure on you. You are not even aware. Today if you see a small child, he's not even bothered if he's standing in the middle of the road. He knows nothing. He's just a free bird. He actually doesn't, I mean, he's not aware of the facts around. He is living in his own sweet dream world. He's living that world. He, it's not a dream for him. He's actually living in that world. So this is how he describes, he says, this is how I was free to do anything and everything at any point of time. As long as I obeyed my father, yes, as long as I obeyed my father and abided by the customs of my tribe, abided by as in acts, uh, acted in accordance with the rule, decision, advice or custom. Just like you have to abide by the rules of the school that you are studying in, you have to follow them, you have to accept them. And yes, that's ethics. You're supposed to do that. Likewise, you have a tradition, a custom in the family. See, nowadays I have seen quite a few children, you know, going against it. So what if we don't do it? Oh, forget it. Now it's tradition going on. Now, there is often a reason, you know, where they say blind following the blind. As in, uh, just because our generations, our, you know, uh, uh, ancestors did it, we also should do it. But there are certain, you know, good reasons behind it, good intentions behind it. So if you have been asked by your parents or your family members to do something, go ahead and do it. There's no harm because our ancestors were very wise. They were extremely wise. Today, you know, when you have eating your meal during, uh, before sunset. Why? Because that time you're, there is a logical reason, there's a scientific reason to it. That, you know, there is uh, your, uh, your digestive system is maximum at that point of time. After sunset, it starts diminishing, it starts decreasing. And that's the reason you tend to become fat or obese and stuff, stuff, stuff. Then it's all diseases. It's all about it. What I'm trying to get at is, you need to follow those customs and traditions. So he says, so far as I, you know, obeyed my father and I accepted the customs of my tribe, whatever I was supposed to do, I did. 
I was not troubled by the laws of man or God. He says, nobody bothered me. If I followed it, I was, you know, with the flow, then it was okay. Nobody ever troubled me by the laws of man or God. He was not troubled by the laws of man because he went with them. And neither was he troubled by the laws of God because there also he was okay with it. He accepted and did accordingly. It was only when I began to learn that my boyhood freedom was an illusion. Illusion as in something that appears to be real, but it is not. Now, the boyhood freedom was supposed, it was like an imagination. It was not real. When I discovered as a young man that my freedom had already been taken from me, that I began uh, to hunger for it. He says, that's when I grew up. When I understood the whole thing, that is the time I actually lost my freedom and it was taken from me. That was the time I began to hunger for it. That is the time I started to long for it because I had enjoyed freedom before that. Isn't that beautiful? That is where he realized when he grew young, he realized that, oh my God, I have lost it all. So many responsibilities to shoulder, so many things, so many rules to abide by. Previously, he very innocently did everything, but later came the hunger for it. This is what he's trying to tell us. At first, as a student, I wanted freedom only for myself. The transitory freedoms of being able to stay out at night, read what I pleased and go where I chose. So, as a student, what were the freedoms he looked for? I wanted freedom only for myself. See, you know, when you are growing younger, your adolescence, you know, you start just thinking about yourself. You become the me person. So he wanted freedom for myself, for himself. The transitory freedoms, transitory as in not permanent. You know, the temporary freedoms of being able to stay out at night. Being a boy, he wanted to stay out at night. He wanted to read what pleased him. Not what you tell me to read. I will read what I want, what I like and go wherever I want. Later, as a young man in Johannesburg, I yearned for the basic and honorable freedoms of achieving my potential, as in my capacity to develop into something in the future. What was my potential? What was I able to get at? Yes, of marrying and having a family, the freedom not to be obstructed in a lawful life. Now see, he is giving you all the different levels of freedom. Please try and understand. Here he is telling you as a student, what all freedoms did he want? Later as a young man, when he was in Johannesburg, what are the freedoms he looked at? He looked for the basic and honorable freedoms of achieving what I could achieve. What was the potential that I had, the ability that I have to achieve? I wanted that of earning my keep. I, whatever I could earn myself of marrying and having a family, that was the freedom he looked for. The freedom not to be obstructed in a lawful life. He says, I wanted all of these freedoms and they should not be stopped, you know, in a lawful life. But then I slowly saw that not only was I not free, but my brothers and sisters were not free. He says, it was not just me. Even my brothers and sisters were sailing in the same boat. Even they were not free. I saw that it was not just my freedom that was curtailed, as in that was reduced, but the freedom of everyone who looked like I did. That is the time he realized. When he grew young, he says, so all these freedoms, now all those who looked like me, that means all those who were dark skin, all those who were looking like me, all of them were facing their freedom had been curtailed. It had been reduced. They were not given the freedom of anything and everything. That is when I joined the African National Congress. And that is when the hunger for my own freedom became the greater hunger for the freedom of my people.
He says, this is the time I realized that when I saw that everyone who looked like me, everyone did not have the freedom to do what they wanted. That was the time I joined the African National Congress. And that is when the hunger for my own freedom became the greater hunger for the freedom of my people. That time I started looking not, not for my freedom, but for the freedom of my people. I wanted them. That hunger became greater. It became priority then. That was my focus. That became my goal. That I want freedom for everyone. For all the people. It was this desire for the freedom of my people to live their lives with dignity and self-respect that animated my life, that actually gave inspiration, encouragement or renewed vigor to my life that transformed a frightened young man into a bold one that drove a law-abiding attorney, a lawyer to become a criminal that turned a family-loving husband into a man without a home, that forced a life-loving man to live like a monk. What actually made him to become a freedom fighter? This, the desire for the freedom of my people to live their lives with dignity and self-respect. This one thing, this one big thing actually literally animated his life. They brought the changes to what he was a lawyer. He became a criminal from a family person. He became literally, you know, a homeless person. He started living elsewhere from a life loving man. He became like a monk. So all, you know, the whole thought process of his changed. Why? Because his goal was different. As per his goal, what he wanted to achieve, he had to change. He literally changed all his roles. I am no more virtuous or self-sacrificing than the next man. Virtuous is a man, you know, or I mean, you are having or showing high moral standards. The, the standards, the moral values are really high. He says, I am no longer having them. I'm out of it. No more virtuous or self-sacrificing than the next man. But I found that I could not even enjoy the poor and limited freedoms I was allowed when I knew my people were not free. He says, when my people were not free, they were in pain. How could I enjoy even if they were the poor and limited freedoms? He's saying even that I could not digest. Why? Because I could see my people in pain. I could see them suffering. I could see them going through torture. How would I enjoy? Freedom is indivisible. The chains on any one of my people were the chains on all of them. They were all interconnected. If it was on one, it was on all of them. The chains on all of my people were the chains on me. Just like they were bonded, you know, with total, uh, you know, disrespect and they had all the pains to go through. If those chains were on them, they were on me. It was they were having the pain. I was, they were going through the torture. I was feeling the pain. We were all connected. I knew that the oppressor must be liberated just as surely as the oppressed. Oppressor is the one who does the wrong and oppressed is the one who takes the wrong, who was going through the torture. This oppressor tortures and this one, the oppressed, takes the torture. So he says both needed to be liberated. Both had to actually come back to live a normal life. A man who takes away another man's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. Obviously, today if I take away your freedom of speech, you'll start hating me. Today if I tell you, okay, you, uh, you are not supposed to, you know, uh, uh, talk to your friends after nine in the night, you'll start hating me, right? This is the same thing that happened. He, if a man who takes away another man's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. He is locked behind the bars of prejudice and narrow-mindedness. He is considered as a, you know, he's uh, hidden behind the bars of prejudice. Prejudice as in, there is a strong dislike without any good reason. You will just start hating me. He says, what kind of a person is she? You know, you'll just simply start hating me and because of my narrow-mindedness. That, come on, in today's world, people are, you know, chatting all night long and she's not letting us talk after nine. 
So this is what I will be put behind that level, behind that category. I am not truly free if I am taking away someone else's freedom. Just as surely as I am not free when my freedom is taken from me. Both the ways. He says, I am not free. I am not truly free. You know, if I am taking away someone else's freedom, I am also not free. Likewise, just as surely as I am not free when my freedom is taken from me. Both the ways, both the people will suffer. The oppressed and the oppressor alike are robbed of their humanity. Both of them lose their humanity. The one who he is torturing, he's lost his humanity. That poor person who is being tortured also loses his humanity because he just takes it. So they both are actually in that same boat. They both need to be liberated. They both are robbed of their humanity, the oppressor and the oppressed. This is how Nelson Mandela looked at it. And this is where after a lot of, I mean, after this long walk, now, this long walk that we had through all the pages of the chapter, but we got to know exactly what was the long walk which Nelson Mandela went through. And finally, on the 10th of May, 1994, he attained the freedom. So you see, imagine now, this is just a part of his autobiography. There is so much more in his life that must have happened, which right now in this chapter, we know a part of it. And what does he conclude our chapter with? What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. Don't just live. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. There you go, Nelson Mandela again. He says, you know what makes a difference? When you make a difference in someone else's life, Please don't live a selfish life. Don't just live. Don't live for yourselves. Live for others. You will be way more happier. And remember one thing. When you live for others, your life becomes way more happier. Try it. Try doing that. It will make a big difference. See, this is what he says. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. The importance of the life that you are leading will come after you have made a difference in someone else's life in a positive manner. Let me actually make it very clear to you. You are making someone else live a better life. You're helping them out. You're sorting their issues. Yes, in that case. But see, everything has to be done in a proper manner through a proper channel. So don't just, just do it just because it's been told. But yes, please make sure you bring a smile. You be the reason for everyone else's smile. And I'm telling you, you'll be the happiest person on earth. Yes, right now I know I am happy because I actually have explained that entire chapter to you. And I'm sure by now you have understood it all. Yes, so my job is done and I'm really happy for still more lessons. Keep watching and keep learning.